This lecture is a brief introduction to kelp forest in the Salish Sea, um, specifically talking about two of the main kelp species we have here in the Salish Sea. Um, these are both images of Neurocystis, the bull kelp. But we also have the giant kelp or uh, Macrocystis, which we'll learn about the differences of the two and how they help form very critical um, and very productive habitats here in the Salish Sea. This uh, graph up on the top, this image up on the top, shows the two main species of kelp we have here in the Salish Sea. On the left is Neurocystis leucina, or the bull kelp. Uh, the bull kelp is uh, in kind of Puget Sound area and in more inland waters. One of the more common species that you'll see uh, for kelp, which is um, easily identifiable by this large bulb and then kind of hair-like um, uh, blades coming off of that. Compared to Macrocystis porphyra, which has a stipe with many um, pneumatocysts or these kind of gas-filled bulbs with blades coming off of that. So uh, these we frequently see washed up on shore, and here's an image of a singular one down below. Um, they're both brown algae and they're both vitally important to the Salish Sea. They are primary producers, so they're converting sunlight into energy. Um, they're both very fast growing um, algae. Macrocystis porphyra is frequently cited as the fastest growing algae in the world when it can grow up to two feet per day. Um, they're both typically found um, about 15 feet deep down to at max 100 or 120 feet of depth. Now for these to grow at 120 feet of depth, you would, have, you would imagine that the water quality has to be quite good. The clarity of the water has to be good for light to penetrate that deep down to allow photosynthesis to occur. So both of these species are uh, very susceptible to being light limited, which makes them susceptible to water pollution, specifically things like um, stormwater runoff that often increases the turbidity of the water, which is just a word meaning uh, makes the water less clear and harder to see through. So both of these species require uh, really clear water. They also require a fair amount of nutrients, and so they have to have uh, fresh nutrients brought in from the deep ocean to survive. Um, they're pretty interesting um, organisms that they grow so quick and they're actually, they're algae, they're not um, a traditional vascular plant, but even as such, they can move nutrients from down below to up above. Um, just like a vascular plant can move nutrients from its roots to its leaves, kelp can do the same thing which is really important because in the ocean, um, the water is stratified. So the upper part of the water column might not have a lot of nutrients, but that's where all your, uh, that's where all your blades are that are absorbing um, energy, that are absorbing light to photosynthesize. So those are the parts of your, the, the algae that need the most nutrients. However, most of the nutrients live in the deeper part of the ocean down here. So they can actually move nutrients up and down, which is pretty fascinating. We'll go over a couple of the terms that we use when we're talking about kelp. Um, starting at the bottom, one is the hold fast. These aren't roots, but a hold fast is a root like structure. Typically, the hold fast um, is, is stuck to a rock or some sort of hard object for it to, to, um, for it to uh, stay anchored. And so, it's really important for these things to be anchored. They typically live in areas with a fair amount of current. Um, and so, they typically anchor to either a, a bedrock, either a bottom that's all rock, or if it is a sandier su substrate, there'll be rocks within that that they attach to. Moving up from the holdfast, we have the stipe. Um, the stipe here is effectively the stem. It's like the, the sort of long backbone part of the kelp. Um, on the neurocystis, this terminates with uh, this large bulb here called a pneumatocyst. Um, they're actually full of carbon monoxide. Um, it's just a gas-filled bladder. 
that helps keep it afloat. Attached to that are a number of blades um, here. And so on the neurocystis, you go hold fast, stipe, pneumatocyst, um, and then a series of blades. And, and for the neurocystis, it's kind of forked, kind of bifurcated here. Um, and there can be up to 10 or 15 or more blades attached to the nematocyst. Now, macrocystis are a fair amount, um, are fundamentally the same, but, but shape-wise, they're a, a lot different. I think they're actually very beautiful if you look at this image down here. So here we have our hold fast, just the same, and then our stipe. And the stipe can split down here um, and have multiple stipes coming up off of one hold fast that um, terminates a bit lower. Um, and then here, instead of one large pneumatocyst, we have a series of pneumatocysts. Each of these are gas-filled bladders that help keep the, the algae floating. And then each of these pneumatocysts has one blade attached to it. So on macrocystis, we have many pneumatocysts. Each pneumatocyst has one blade attached compared to a neurocystis where we have one pneumatocyst attached, uh, which has coming out of it many blades. Uh, both species, this diagram doesn't really show up, but both species have uh, sporophylls down here, and we'll talk a, a bit more about the reproductive um, pattern for, for kelps. It's uh, pretty fascinating that they reproduce a lot differently than, um, you know, terrestrial plants or other things we might be familiar with. Um, here's a diagram showing the reproduction of, this image is meant to show macrocystis. It's similar for neurocystis. I'm only going to talk about one of them because they more or less do the same thing. So the adult uh, algae that we see when we're um, out on the water or we see washed up on the beach is referred to as the sporophyte. So this is the life stage of kelp that produces spores. Um, so these spores here are free swimming zoospores. These are not eggs and sperm. These are, these are free swimming spores that then land on the, on the ocean bottom and then they either uh, produce either um, female or male gametes. So they, the spores that float around the ocean land somewhere. If they're male, then they grow and start releasing sperm. If they're female, they grow and start producing eggs. Typically, what happens here is the female produces one egg and then waits for a, a sperm to come um, and fertilize that egg. And then at that point, it becomes a microscopic sporite. So then it ultimately grows up to being the big spore fight. Um, so it's a bit different where they're not producing eggs and sperm, they're producing zoospores that then land and then produce gametes. And then those gametes go on, fertilize, and then grow into the large plant, or sorry, large algae. And then that algae then produces zoospores that then land and then depending on a variety of sort of unknown conditions will either become male or female gametophytes and those gametophytes depending on uh, whether they're male or female will produce either eggs or sperm. This is called alteration of generations meaning if we just have a sporophyte it doesn't make more sporophytes. Um, you need to have a surviving sporophyte and a surviving gametophyte um, and both of these life stages are important so you can imagine in the winter, if the sporophytes get knocked out, but the gametophytes are still there pumping out eggs and sperm, that's creating the next generation of sporophytes that will then grow throughout the summer, release a bunch of zoospores that then land on the, on the bottom of the ocean, which is called the benthos, um, and create a bunch more gametes. Uh, so it's a pretty unique life history strategy that we see in kelp. Um, this is uh, some examples of a kelp forest. Now, 
Uh, there's a variety of different looks of kelp forest, but here we have our Nerocystis our bull kelp forest. Um, this is more or less what we would expect to see uh, in areas like Afnia Bay, uh, some of the rockier areas in the San Juans, Gulf Islands, areas that have bedrock, a decent amount of current. Here you can see the, the water quality is pretty good, the clarity is pretty good, and then your Nerocystis has holdfast attached to the benthos, shooting up uh, the water column, growing um, with the blades coming off the nematocyst. Here is a macrocystis uh, kelp forest. Now this is appears to be soft substrate, right? It appears to be sandy, but there's actually hard rock down here as well. So they're attached to that hard rock that's overlain by sand. Um, here you've got blades going up the entire um, or most of the, the vertical structure of the kelp. Uh, fundamentally, they, they kind of operate in the same way. Um, you can have uh, overstory and understory kelps just like you would in a forest. So really these are uh, frequently referred to as the rainforests of the sea because they're so productive both from a carbon fixing standpoint, right? They're fixing um, a lot of carbon dioxide, creating uh, food for other organisms, um, doing a massive amount of primary productivity, um, but they're also supporting a variety of other organisms. Specifically, whenever we create a three-dimensional structure in what was previously a two-dimensional space, biomass and biodiversity increases. So I'm going to jump back to the prior slide really quick. Let's imagine this macrocystis kelp forest without kelp. What would you see? A bunch of sand, not really much else. In this case of the nerocystis, well, we still have a rocky, uh, rocky benthos, so there would be some um, understory kelps and things like that growing, but not nearly the diversity of other species that are consuming um, either the kelp directly or consuming the things that are consuming the kelp. Um, additionally, this is providing shade and protection from other predators. It's providing some structure. So you can imagine this without kelp, more or less a sand flat, not the most interesting place in the world. We have a, a healthy kelp forest. Then we have little nooks and crannies for fish to hide in. These fish are picking off isopods and other things that are living on the kelp eating the kelp or eating the film on, on the kelp. Uh, and then in turn, there's bigger fish to eat the smaller fish and so on and so forth, sort of the you know, circle of life in the ocean. But without kelp, we lose all of that. The same way you could think about a rainforest, if you cut down all the trees, it's not nearly as interesting of a place. So kelp are foundational species that really define the marine ecosystems. With the loss of kelp, we lose many other species. Thinking back to the maiden story, um, I like to, to think, and, and the story says that she um, can be seen in the water, her hair can be flowing in the water at Deception Pass. They're talking about uh, neurocystis blades, that these uh, blades, particularly the neurocystis, are at the surface and they wave back and forth and it, and it does look like long hair. And so as we, if we lose the maiden, if we lose kelp, then we lose a massive amount of productivity in the ocean. A lot of that productivity is creating food, um, different fishes that are consumed, rockfish, lingcod, as well as other things like urchins and abalone um, and other uh, uh, herbivore snails, things like that. So super, super vital. Um, and really, if we lose kelp, then our ecosystems are uh, quite endangered. As well as, uh, if you've walked on the beach, you might be familiar with this scene of a big pile of kelp on the beach. Uh, we call this rack. It just means dead things that are washed up on the beach. Uh, in this case, it's primarily Nerocystis, the bull kelp. And this bull kelp washes up on the beach, and while it might be annoying because you have to walk around it, or it could be stinky or covered in little jumping isopods, it's providing a massive amount of nutrients to the near shore. So kelp is providing nutrients to the ecosystem it's, it lives in, the kelp forest, but it's also exporting nutrients to other areas. Some of this kelp doesn't wash up on the beach, some of it washes down in the deeper ocean, 
and there it provides a valuable um, valuable nutrition for the animals that live down there. So kelp was massively important for um, the kelp forest, but also the surrounding ecosystems, both deeper and shallower. In Puget Sound and Salish Sea, we've seen a big reduction of kelp forest, um, particularly bull kelp, over the past few years. So many groups, Puget Sound Restoration Fund um, amongst them, the Samish Nation, many other tribes are really concerned about this loss of bull kelp. Uh, bull kelp both is a traditional food. Um, it's consumed. Uh, you can dry it. Uh, you can use it for cooking the both the blades um, and the actually the stipe as well. You can um, use it for uh, creating tools. You can put um, you wood or ironwood in it and then heat that up over fire and it'll steam that wood and then you can bend it um, as well as again the, the uh, blades being consumed. Um, in the modern there's a couple pickled kelp recipes as well. You can take the stipes and cut it up and make kelp pickles. Um, there's a lot of use for the blades both um, commercially as well. Toothpaste and ice cream are kind of common examples as well as some spawn on kelp for herring, which uh, we might touch on later. But they have a massive uh, human value from that context. There's also the symbolism with the maiden, um, as well as providing a massive ecosystem service. And so we're seeing a, a massive decline of bull kelp in the Salish Sea, and a number of groups have tried to restore bull kelp. And what they're doing is actually growing bull kelp in the lab and then transplanting it out in the environment to try to see if, if it will take. Um, and it's a very, it sounds kind of easy, like, oh yeah, whatever, I do that with my tomatoes. But it's a fair amount harder with bulk kelp, both because um, they're pretty finicky and working in the ocean tends to be a lot harder than working in your backyard. So there's a fair amount of concern about bulk kelp um, and some work to, to protect it. Um, I think it's a really interesting species and it's that umbrella species that when you have a healthy kelp forest, you have a healthy food web, and you have um, a very productive ecosystem. And so it's definitely an indicator of overall environmental health. Uh, with that, Heishka, thank you.